Hello everyone, welcome to Green When and to our special This Is My Architecture series. We wanted to share a couple of This Is My Architecture sessions today and provide some additional context on questions asked and service updates in these videos. We have two sessions lined up for you today. Let's get started with Zoho, where I talk to Raji on how they built Site 24-7 a scalable real-time user monitoring system on AWS. Let's go watch it. Hi, and welcome to another episode of This Is My Architecture. I'm Aarti from AWS, and joining me in Mumbai today is Raji from Zoho. Raji, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Aarti. So Raji, tell us what Zoho does and what is your specific role? Zoho has a suite of online applications that are needed for end-to-end -end operation of any business. And I'm a product manager in Zoho for the product called Site 24-7. Site 24-7 is the monitoring solution that does monitoring for the full stack of your application, starting from your end user layer to your application layer to platform layer to your infrastructure layer. It gives the full all-in-one monitoring solution. And what are we going to talk about today? You mentioned the monitoring solutions. Is that what we're going to like dive into today? You know, monitoring solution, the site 24-7, we run it on our servers. And we wanted to do the real user monitoring as a feature, which we faced some problems when we had to run it on our, on our own servers. And that's when we wanted to use AWS. And that's what we are going to talk about today. Great. Uh, can you elaborate on some of the challenges uh, of running this real user monitoring on-prem before we dive into the architecture? Yeah. As I said, the real user monitoring, it's the real-time monitoring of end users' experience as to how the application is behaving across geographies, how the application is behaving, um, how is it differing with respect to ISPs, how is it differing with respect to browsers, with respect to devices. There are so many things that we collect from real-time users. Having said that, this is a real-time um, environment. We don't know the number of requests that we are going to get in. So the volume, the elasticity, the scaling part, we can't handle it on our own servers. And that's when we wanted to move to AWS. Great. Why don't we dive into the architecture of how you do this real user monitoring? Yeah. So as I said, it starts with the user's browser. So the user has to download the script into that browser. So for which the request is actually routed through Route 53 and it reaches the CDN. So the request comes to CDN, and then the actual script, the beacon script we call it, is downloaded in the browser, and then that actually does the data collection part, the various data that I talked about. So the beacon collects all the data, and as and when it collects, it again routes through Route 53 to the ALBs. And from ALBs, we just move it to the collectors. The collectors are nothing but a uh, group of EC2 instances, which are auto-scaled. And uh, from here, we actually push the data to SQS. OK. So once you collect all this data on the EC2 instances and then push it to the NSQS queue, what happens after that? And maybe before even I go to that, I want to say why we are using this auto-scaling environment for the EC2 instances. I said we'll get huge amount of request. It's something like we get up to 25 million requests a day on normal days. And on peak days, peak load days, it actually doubles. We get 50 million requests a day and 50,000 requests per minute. So such scales is possible only using the auto-scaled collectors. Now, after this collects the information and puts into SQS, we have another set of EC2 instances which are auto-scaled. And that we call it as processes, which again, fetches the information from SQS and does all the calculations that we want to do, does all the processing. And we use two components here. One is for caching, other is for database storage. And for caching, we use Redis, do the, have it in the cache and do the processing. And finally, store the data into Cassandra. And this Cassandra is actually across multiple availability zones so that we take care of high availability. It's a cluster so that we can take care of high availability of the data. 
I think you bring a good point about the high availability architecture here, uh, especially you talked about the scalability with auto scaling instances. So is this entire architecture that we're seeing here, is this ru running in a single region across availability zones or how are your users directed to like different, re from different regions directed? Yeah, so this is one architecture. We have customers across the globe, but then we don't use the same in multi-region. We have the similar architecture in different regions that's mainly because the data, we have the data residing in these servers. Those are again EC2 instances. And uh, there are a lot of regulations that comes with each of the countries. Say for example, if you take the EU, .EU um, GDPR has to be compliant and uh, you can't have your customer's data taken out of the EU borders. So each and every country is coming up with their own regulations and customers don't want their data to go out. So that's the main reason we have the similar set of architectures in different regions. So when a user request comes in based on the domain name like .com, .eu or .in, it gets routed to the individual regions accordingly. Perfect. That's how it is. Okay. So once the processor like completes all its function here, you then send data based on whether you're doing caching or to the Redis or to Cassandra. What happens in this side of the world? Like I see a dashboard here. Yeah. So the all these data collected is being stored. Then the user has to view it in the dashboard. As I said, Site24-7 runs it on our own servers. Now. The dashboard is also on the server. We need to get the information. So those are API requests that again comes through Route 53 to the ALBs and from here to the processors. And the processors fetches it from the Cassandra database and gives the data to the user for them to view the real-time experience of their applications, where exactly the problem, if there is any JavaScript errors, are there how the snapshot is, how the resources are loaded. So all the information that we have collected and stored it in the Cassandra is viewed in the dashboard using another, that's the component there. Uh, this is a neat architecture, especially like having operations person view like real-time metrics is super important to having like a very reliant, reliable architecture. Uh, what are some of the future enhancements that you're thinking with this architecture? So we have three things in mind. One is this Route 53 component. We can actually make use of the geo-based Route 53. Even though we have this architecture in uh, deployment in multiple regions, we can make use of geo-based Route 53 to route it to that region. So that's one thing we have in plan. The second thing is, this is again a simple collector which just collects the information and pushes the data to the SQS. So I need not have these uh, as an EC2 instance or an application running in EC2 instance. I can replace this with Lambda functions that takes care of again pushing the data to SQS. Again, Lambda function is elastic elastically scalable as well. And the third important thing is maintaining this deployment. So we have to take care of updating the bills in each of these places and maintaining in multiple regions is again a headache for us. So I'm thinking if we can use the code deploy to do all those automations for us so it is easy for us. Automate and make it easy. Yeah. Uh, Raji, thank you for sharing how Site24-7 uses AWS to do real user monitoring. Uh, great architecture, and thank you for joining us today. And thank you for watching This Is My Architecture. See you soon. And that's a wrap to how Site24 by 7 built their monitoring systems on AWS. Next, we move from monitoring to more security with Ryan from William Hill talking about how they built DDoS protection on AWS. Let's go watch it. Welcome to This Is My Architecture. My name is Peter, and I'm here with Ryan from William Hill. Hi, Ryan. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. All right, so what do you guys do? So William Hill is one of the world's leading bet betting and gaming companies. We provide gaming applications for customers all around the world on many different platforms. All right. I know that you've been subject to a larger DDoS attack uh, um, some time ago, and you've decided to move your um, security posture into the cloud. Uh, what's the actual um, um, issue you've had to deal with? So in 2016, we were the victims of a major DDoS attack, which utilized one of the largest botnets of the time, the Mirai botnet. And at its peak, we were hit with over 177 gigabits a second, which impacted our applications. All right, that's uh, something. So you have chosen a couple of services. Uh, let's talk through the architecture. Sure, so in front of our, all of our applications, we have CloudFront. And uh, we use CloudFront's partner, um, applications uh, to mitigate against DDoSs. So we use Shield Advanced, 
to be able to mitigate both uh, layer three and layer seven, uh, and layer three and layer four uh, DDoS attempts, things such as uh, act floods or sin floods. Um, also, uh, low complexity uh, layer seven attacks, uh, such as HTTP floods. Uh, for more complicated layer seven attacks, we use uh, WAF, where we can create uh, filters to block more complicated attacks. This is a good time in the architecture to talk about Shield Advance. Ryan talks about how they used Shield Advance to protect against layer three and layer four attacks. One recent feature we launched this year that may be of interest is protection groups. AWS Shield Advance now allows you to bundle resources like your platform distribution, for example, into these protection groups, giving you a self-service way to customize the scope of detection and mitigation for your application by treating multiple resources as a single unit. Let's go back to hearing how they completed their security architecture framework. All right, so use uh, Shield Advance to increase scale out to swallow the incoming uh, flood and use WAF to make sure that you block. Now there's more to this. Uh, talk us through. Sure, so from CloudFront and the protection that's, that's therein, we send the traffic across to uh, Route 53, where we have two separate uh, Route 53 hosted zones, mm -hmm. um, one for uh, traffic going to an ELB, for traffic going to an ELB, we just send uh, non-sensitive traffic. Mm -hmm. But for more sensitive traffic, we send the traffic across to an EC2 instance, mm -hmm. which hosts um, a F5 big IP, which is another form of WAF, and that adds an extra layer of protection um, on top of the WAF we already have on CloudFront. I see. So you do basically introduce another layer to make sure that you are able to t tackle even more uh, types and variations of attacks uh, with F5 being involved here. Um, I see this is happening within a VPC, so there's a segregation. Uh, what happens to the rest of the services? Yeah, so once the traffic goes through uh, the VPC, we send it to across to uh, a VPC pairing, which sends the traffic to one of our seven different uh, channel accounts mm -hmm. where our applications actually sit. So from the VPC pairing, we see it goes across to the VPCs in those accounts, which allows uh, developers to create applications uh, with the DDoS protection already built in. Mm -hmm. I see. So you do send uh, filtered and non-filtered traffic down here to your uh, kind of cloud environment. And there's on-prem involved as well. I see uh, Direct Connect. Um, how does that um, collaborate? Sure, yeah, so we're still in the process of, of migrating to the cloud, so we have a number of applications that actually sit on our on-premise data centers. Mm -hmm. So traffic from both BC2 instances and from the ELB mm -hmm. go through to Direct Connect, uh, which then allows our customers traffic to go to our on-prem application servers. All right, okay, so we're done with this part, uh, on-premise involved, um, but I see some more services, what about these? Sure, yeah, so for an added layer of protection, uh, we send traffic, uh, we send logs of our traffic from CloudFront over to an S3 bucket. Mm -hmm. From there, we then send the logs across to our on-premise uh, analysis servers, mm -hmm. uh, which use both proprietary and third-party um, analytics and uh, equations to be able to identify further malicious traffic. Um, once that traffic is identified, we then send the, uh, the IP addresses back up to AWS and to this DynamoDB instance we see here. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, basically the IP addresses uh, are added to a table within mm -hmm. DynamoDB, um, both with, their, uh, with an expiration date mm -hmm. um, due to the nature of IP addresses and them changing constantly. Um, there is a Lambda function which then runs that, that inspects that table for any new entries or for any, um, or for any expired entries. And then updates the WAF filters with those IP addresses. So, so it looks like a continuous improvement flow uh, to your WAF filters. Exactly. Uh, utilize the direct connect connection with the low latency and uh, high bandwidth to make sure that uh, you have uh, no losses in terms of uh, um, um, connection. And um, yeah, thank you, Ryan. Thanks for sharing this uh, very interesting solution. And thanks for watching. This is my architecture. That's the 
an impressive way to use Lambda functions to inspect DynamoDB table and then update the BAF filters with the IP addresses. One thing I want to add here is with the latest version of AWS BAF, we support variable CIDR ranges for IP sets, giving you the flexibility. For IPv4, for instance, we support slash 1 to slash 32. And for IPv6, we support slash 1 to slash 128. The IP set match statement inspects the IP address of a web request against a set of IP addresses and address ranges. So you can use this to either allow or block web requests based on the IP addresses. One additional thing to note here, by default, AWS WAF uses the IP address from the web request origin, but you can definitely configure the rule to use an HTTP header like X forwarded for instead. And that's a wrap for this is my architecture session at reInvent. We hope you enjoyed the two videos and the additional information. See you soon in another This Is My Architecture session.